So good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to see everybody this morning. A nice full room. So, uh, my name is Brett Janelle, and I'm one of the hosts of the Retired Living Truth series, along with my wife, Annette Janelle, for those who don't know us. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. And I wanted to thank several people who came up and said how wonderful it was to have our education partners outside again. And we're kind of getting back to normal. And let me just touch on masks. So if you wish to wear a mask, you're obviously more than welcome. Um, our speakers won't wear masks so that you can hear us clearly from the front and we'll keep our distance. If you're drinking coffee, tea, and prefer to have your mask off, we're okay with that. Um, but if you wish to wear a mask, of course, that's okay too. So hopefully that kind of clarifies. It's kind of in a unknown territory with masks, no masks. Uh, but yeah, CDC requirements still says we should wear masks in, inside. So. Uh, so I'm really excited about today's topic, the truth about spending your nest egg, um, for several reasons. And, uh, but first, uh, who's having trouble spending their money at the moment? Has anyone challenged spending money? No, we've all got that pretty well mastered. Is anyone maybe fearful at all whether we have enough money for how long we might live? Anyone? Because I certainly do. It's like it's gonna have a, a few people. And the rest of you are just independently wealthy and don't have to worry about it. Yeah, very good, excellent. So I'm excited about the guests that we have today. I have had the opportunity to get to know this gentleman a little bit over the past number of months. And uh, he's a local television celebrity. And who tunes in on Sunday evenings at 5.30 to, uh, not planning your retirement, help me, Chris, name of the program? Redefining. Redefining Retirement. And Chris has a mindset similar to Annette and I and our education partners of wanting to bring education to retirees that, um, you can trust and ask questions about without the fear of being sold. And that's the whole reason we do the True Series. And so why Chris does his television program so you can learn more about redefining retirement and anonymous and, and just learn. So I really like what Chris and his colleagues have to say. So I asked Chris and his colleague Curtis to come along and join us today and help us understand a little more about some of the issues when it comes to spending our nest egg. So if I could have you Chris and Curtis come up and join me here. These guys are a wealth of knowledge. I spent some good time with them last week asking them all sorts of questions. So if I could start with you, uh, Chris, would you just introduce yourself to the audience, why you might be here today and a little bit about, about your background? Be happy to. Thanks, sir. Thanks for having us, Brett. Uh, my name is Chris Apps, and uh, some of you might know me as president and founder of Cornerstone Retirement Group, where specifically we help people to we help people to get get them to and through retirement. Some of you might know me as the host of Redefining Retirement. It airs every Sunday at five thirty on KTVN Channel Two for the last sixteen seasons. So again, Brett, thanks for having us. You're welcome, Curtis. Uh, my name is Curtis Slothauer. Uh, I'm a financial advisor at Cornerstone Wealth Management. Uh, I've been there for, what, eight years? Uh, I've been in finance for over 20. Uh, born and raised here in Reno, Nevada. So look forward. I'm glad. Thanks for having us and look forward to it. My pleasure. If I could start with you, Chris. So you work with a lot of retirees, obviously. Do they generally, as a whole, have concerns about uh, having sufficient funds in retirement? Oh my gosh, that is a that is a loaded question. I, I think it runs the full gamut. I think s some people come in and they are, they're concerned about running out of money. And other people come in and they're not concerned about running out of money. So there, there's this huge gamut. But I think for most people, I, I think they say it differently, but I think most people basically say, hey, help me to protect my money, help me to take some income and help me to grow it some. And I think today with some of these, these issues that are going on, inflation, taxes, where the economy is, I think something that people don't realize it, but it's a growing demand is what I call income withdrawal sequence. How you take your money from your different assets or sources of, of income in the right way to be more efficient or to be able to pay less in tax, make that money grow, make that money last. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a common concern, but people specifically have their own different individual concerns in that. Okay, so it's not a case of worrying more because we're now retired, it's different across the board from what I'm understanding. Some people are literally concerned about running out of money. And I'll mm -hmm. see that where some people will come in and that's not really their concern, but they're almost afraid to say, this is how much I want in retirement 
But when we run those numbers and they find out, wow, okay, it's not that I'm going to run out of money. As long as I invest my money properly and make it grow and not lose it and maybe the next market correction, they realize they're going to be okay. You can see it in their physical demeanor like, wow, okay, I actually did achieve financial freedom. Now my job is not to lose it, but basically to, you know, to, to keep it, preserve it. Exactly. So Curtis, um, when you're talking to clients, what are their concerns in terms of wanting to spend money, in terms of what they're wanting to spend it on, and they're perhaps hesitant of spending money because obviously we don't want to run out. What sort of things are people wanting to do and it's like, can I do this or not? Well, Chris has a really good story about that, but I think there, there's always the needs and the wants. So some people have their needs. Needs are going to be your basic bills, uh, house payments, things of that nature. Some people classify their needs as golf. Chris has a great story about that as well. So needs and wants can always change, but everybody's going to have a little bit of a different take of what they need and what they want. The key to that is having a plan in place that you understand kind of that inflow outflow. How much are we spending? How much do we need to spend? And like Chris said, you're keeping things on top of that. Uh, what does inflation add to that? What do taxes add to that? So it's going to be that need one, kind of a mix. There's no real set take. It's everybody's individual. Can I add, add yeah, to please, that? Yeah, please, I've been doing this for 30 years and, and I've learned, I, we do not tell people to spend their money. You either are a saver or you're a spender and you do not need a financial advisor to tell you to spend your money. It's not our job. Our job is to show you, here's the path that you're on. Here's what it looks like. Here, based on how much income you want, and let's adjust it for inflation. Let's adjust the, the income needs for inflation. Let's show you taking those withdrawals based on that rate of return. Let's show you how much risk you're taking. And if you had another market correction, how much you would lose and how it would, would affect your, your, in your finances. And, and let you decide how you feel about that. Some of you are okay with that. Some of you say, well, I didn't, I didn't realize I was taking that much risk. Some people say, well, I, I guess I could take more income if I, if I wanted to. You know, we, we, in our industry, we talk about the difference between needs and wants, right? Need is money that you need to pay those bills, you know, Sunday all the way through Saturday and wants are some of those things that you want to do. And I, I've learned never to assume. I remember years ago, I had this, uh, this couple, they retired and in their budget, they wanted like, $40,000 a year for golf. And good for them. They worked hard. Obviously, golf was important to them. And I assumed that was a want. So I put it in their want category. And they said, Chris, why did you do that? So see, I assumed. And they said, no, no, no. We are retiring. That's not a want. That's, that's a need. That is, that is what we want retirement to look like. That is a need. And they said, we want a plan that even if the market has a correction, that we are going to be OK. And I remember back then in 2008, remember then when the, the, the economy fell apart back then, they had a plan so that even if the economy would fall apart, they could still continue to golf and be okay. So we never make assumptions on what, what your needs are, what your wants are. We just feed back what we've heard from you and project it out and say, here's the path that you're on and can we help you do a better job? Can we bring some value in that? Did anyone quickly do the math on $40,000 worth of golf? How often that is? How many times a week? Uh <laughs> That's a lot of golfing. That's a lot of golf. Yeah. So we talked about needs and wa needs and wants. So do you find that there are people who are meeting their needs and have the ability to do some of their wants but aren't because they're really focused on their needs? Is that something that you come across often, or is that a rarity? Yeah, everyone's everyone's different from an income standpoint of what what they want. And I, just this week. I was able to get back with this, uh, this really neat couple. And the first time I met with them, I asked her, I said, how much do you need or want an income to live the lifestyle that you're dreaming about? What do you want? And I read her body language and it matched up with the number that she told me. And it was a small number in relation to what she should have told me. And I get what was going on in her mind. She was afraid to dream this number. And that matters because I remember, I'll never forget this. This lady walked in my office. She was 85 years old. I'd never met her before. And I asked her, I said, you, you've done a good job. Why are you in my office? What, what help do you want? And she shared a story with me that I will never forget. And she basically said, she said, Chris, I wish I had come to see you 20, 25 years ago. Because, and she started to talk about all the things that she didn't do 
These are the things I could have done when my husband was still alive. These are the things I could have done with my kids. These are the things I could have done with my grandkids. I was afraid to do it. I didn't know I could. And now I can't anymore. And I've got all this money. And what's the, what's the point? So it's just, I, I enjoy being able to listen to people, what their goals are and dreams are, and be able to show, here's the path you're on. Is this possible? Is this achievable? And then measure out what is that, what does the worst case look like? And be able to come back and say, hey, you know, how, how can you, how can you, how can you improve upon that? How can you fix that? I think that's the, one of the most important things, especially where the market is, is today. More. I don't know if I answered your question, no, you did. but I and just we'll, rambled. So. And we'll drill down on some of that more. Um, Curtis, just a quick request from people at home. Could you just lift your mic a little bit? People at home are having trouble a little bit hearing. Is it on? <laughs> yeah, no, there's no volume control. There is on the board down here. Put the okay. clip, what I would Maybe do, there you go. Put the clip on behind and the, there you go. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Better? Okay. We'll see. <laughs> Already sounds better. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to jump to you, Curtis. Sure. So I've always heard that when we retire, and I'm sure you can all attest perhaps to this one way or another, that when we retire, our expenses become less. And I know we have a whole range of different age, both in the room and also online. So we're talking to you know, a range of people in different points of retirement or even pre-retirement. Could you just talk about how do our expenses change? Do they become less? And I heard some people going, no, <laughs> shaking their heads more. And how does it change as we age, as we go through the different chapters, you know, our 70s, 80s, 90s? Sure. Um, great question. I, I think um, the answer is no, it usually doesn't. It doesn't change initially in retirement because people are used to that lifestyle. You're used to living a certain way. Or you've envisioned a certain dream of retirement, $40,000 in golf, $20,000 in travel. So those expenses don't seem to change. Uh, what you see over time, though, is that kind of shifts. Think of it like a, I think of it like a pie chart. And I use my dad as an example. When my dad retired, um, he spent a lot of his early years traveling, did things together, you know, saw the sights, did what he wanted to do. As he got older, though, he kind of slowed down. But what took the place of some of those travel costs, some of those fun costs, but was health expenses. I mean, that's one thing that really kicked up. So I think of it like kind of like a moving pie chart. Those percentages is always going to be there, but you see it kind of switch back and forth as you age. Um, that's just kind of a standard thing to see. Okay, thank you. Anything you want to add to that, Chris? Uh, no, I think you did a good Here job. Go. Of course you did a good job, <laughs> a great job. So the elephant in the room, I guess, right at the moment is this thing called inflation that one of you mentioned briefly. So I'd just like to drill down on that. I'm sure everyone probably read in the news that uh, inflation is what, 6.2% year over year, the highest it's been in 30 years. So what, what does that mean to us? Well, without nerding out, in general terms, inflation just means there's too much money chasing too few goods. And the question you have to ask is, we experienced COVID, and instead of having a recession, the government and the Fed injected, what, about $5 trillion into the economy, and they reduced interest rates, and that prevented this recession. The question that we need to ultimately ask is, are there any consequences of doing that? Well, uh, you know, what, what will happen? Can we have inflation? Can interest rates go up? How high might they go up? How would that impact the, the economy? So everything has been pushed up in value, right? The, the stock market, um, housing, everything is up in, up, in, up in value. So from an inflation standpoint, if you're in retirement, your, your risk is things are going to get more expensive, right? Healthcare is going to get more expensive. Now, this should not be a surprise to you because approximately the last 10 years before, inflation was below average, right? If you look at those numbers, it was below average. So if inflation normally averages around 3% and the last 10 years it was below average, then isn't it realistic to expect that in the future at some point it's gotta be above average to get back to those average numbers with, with me there? Now, back then, we didn't know how we were going to get there. We just knew we should expect that. So no surprise, we have inflation. So how does that impact you moving into and, and, and in, re, in retirement? Well, things are going to get more expensive. And one of the things that I see with retirees is you tend to have push more towards cash, 
more towards less risk assets. And that's wise. You should reduce your, your risk, right? Because you, you need this money than someone who's, say, 30 years old, putting money into their 401k. And if the market goes down, less of an issue for them, more of an issue for you. But I, I, I met with some folks yesterday. They push their money into these into bonds or some of these target date funds. We measured it and said, did and showed them in 2008 when the market had a correction, your bond portfolio lost 36%. If you lost 36% of your money on some assets called safe, if that were to happen again, how does that affect your, your long-term financial security? So it's understanding what your downside is. But from an inflationary standpoint, things will get more expensive. No, no surprise. Healthcare goes up, uh, food goes up, gas, housing, all of those things go up. So how do you prepare for that? It's fairly simple. It's just taking the income that you need or want. We project that out, factoring in a rate of inflation, looking at your portfolio and saying, based upon that rate of return and the risk you're taking, are you going to run out of money or not? Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is, when do you want to know the answer to that? Do you want to know it today or maybe 20 years from now? Because just at a 3% rate of inflation, uh, you need to basically, is it, uh, I think it's, you need to double your money uh, over your retirement years. So just on a regular 3% of inflation for normal retirement, you have to have a plan to double that amount of income over those retirement years. To keep up with the inflation. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if you have any degree of certainty what we can expect with inflation going forward. Is this just a little blip for the year or two or a trend or any thoughts? And do you have your crystal ball here today? My crystal ball, I left at the office, but, it, but it's broken. Um, and it's not so important that we make a projection in terms of saying, hey, where is inflation going to go? Where is the economy going to go? Stand back and look at it. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that the market is near all time highs. Housing is near all-time highs. There's far more risk today than we've, than we've seen for quite a while. The market is way past due for a correction. The market itself has earned over 18% the last five years. We're kind of way up here. The market is high. The market is expensive. So, so moving forward, we know things are going to get expensive. Instead of trying to predict something that we can't control, which is inflation, Let's focus on what we can control. We can control our risk. We can control our rate of return. We can control how much we have in secure income sources, how those income sources actually adjust and keep up with inflation, regardless of what that inflation number is. That's how I would address it. Don't worry about what you can't control. Focus on the things that you can control. Does that, does that make sense? Sounds to me. Uh, Chris, could I get you to put your mic actually on your shirt? Because as you turn your head, I think we're losing volume for people at home. And then Curtis, I'm going to give you a handheld mic. If you could just turn off your lavalier. And then while you're doing that, Curtis, you can multitask. Did you have anything <laughs> we'll you wanted to add to Chris? No, I think- On inflation? We're... No, hey, my crystal ball has been broken. I never had one. So you didn't supply that for me day one. <laughs> So no, I, I, that's a trick question. Inflation, we don't really, I don't know. Yeah. So should we can be concerned about our healthcare costs with inflation? Is it we're going to see an impact there or don't need to worry too much? Ooh, you, bit, you hit on a, on a, on a big yeah. one. It was, the older we get, the more we spend on healthcare, right? I'm 52. Well, you know, I, I see, uh, you know, I go to the doctor more often. I had to go to the dermatologist. You kind of see that right there. And those things get, those things get more, more expensive as time goes on. Fidelity does a study. They send it out every year. You can Google it. I talk about it in my TV show about once a year, talk about the cost of healthcare and, and, and rising. And here's what Fidelity says. They're, they're, they basically say for a married couple, so for the 2021 study, they say for a, it's always the same, for a married couple retiring today who's age 65 and going to live to average life, which you're saying is age 90, that married couple needs to factor in approximately $300,000 for your basic healthcare costs. 
Those are your out-of-pocket, your co-pays, things like that. It has nothing to do with in-home care, long-term care services, has nothing to do with those things at all. Just those, those basic out-of-pockets and, and, and co-pays, about 300,000. It's a little bit more for a single person. Uh, it's about, I think, 165,000 for a single woman. And therefore, I think it's like 140,000 approximately for, 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 a, for a male. What, why is that? Because women tend to outlive men, right? Because that's your, that's your benefit for putting up with us for all those years. But, but with that, if a man doesn't live as long, his costs are going to be less. So if you see that you're going to live longer, like my wife's family, they live into 100 and they just keep going. So they're going to have more costs because they're going to be alive longer. Does that make sense? So for the average person, average retiree, it's 300,000. Doesn't need, mean that you need 300 grand sitting in the account. You just need to factor that in. And as Curtis was saying, as other costs might go down, over time, your healthcare costs continue to climb. So what's that percentage? The percentage is about 6%. So if, if inflation is normally around three, they're projecting that healthcare is increasing about 6%, about double. Does that make sense? I would expect that number in the future to actually rise because of healthcare. I would expect that number to jump a little bit higher, but those are long-term trends. Health, uh, inflation is normally three, healthcare is normally six. You might want to line item that and then increase that at a higher rate of, an, higher rate of inflation. So I saw a lot of blank stares when we heard that big number of $300,000. Yeah, it's like, wow, what? Did we mishear that? So from what I understood from our previous conversation, a lot of that is though is inflation. So 30 years out from now, the cost will have been 300000 but that's because of inflation. As you said, we don't need $300,000 today. They're Right. Just to clarify, they're taking someone who's retiring at 65, adding up those expen expected costs over those retirement years as a, as a whole, expect to spend about $300,000 when you retire to when you pass away for the average life expectancy, average, average health. And does that include, is that... Um, as we reach near end of life and something happens, usually there's some large costs. Is that including that, do you know? Is that like- When you're saying large costs uh, would be above and beyond, like maybe bringing care into the home or maybe heaven forbid, if you had, let's say dementia, dementia or long-term care. care facility does not cover That's, those costs. Those are in addition to that. They do not factor those costs in at all. Wow. So a question I had for you, we talked about, you were just talking, Chris, about, um, married couples, spouses, when a spouse passes, it's come up before in topics, um, what do we need to be aware of in terms of changes in income, taxes, that we can perhaps be proactive and at least be aware of, so maybe as a married couple, we can work on that so that the other one is in the best position possible, should I pass, I would want Annette to be in the most uh, advantageous position versus something we had stupidly done or weren't aware of. No, absolutely. I think one of the big things that's always overlooked is, is a tax strategy, because what happens when we lose a spouse, we change tax brackets to a single taxpayer bracket. Um, that's one of the biggest traps the IRS has out there that no one pays attention to, uh, or, or it's overlooked quite a bit. Um, so getting a tax strategy in place, um, there's a lot of things you can do with that. Because um, the one thing we're, that we're mainly concerned about that is that pre-tax money, IRA money, 401k money. Because we know at 72, and, and some people before it was 70 and a half, we have to take a required distribution. That goes up every year. It's kind of a bell curve. It usually starts around 3.8% and kind of goes up over time. That doesn't change for a surviving spouse. What does change is the income levels on your tax bracket. So having a tax strategy in place to address that can really alleviate some of the additional costs that become a trap if you're not paying attention to it. Can I add to that? Yeah, please, Chris, yeah. Um, kind of a nerdy person. So I like to run some of those numbers. So what I calculated, it was I was seeing something or, or, over these years, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I was seeing something that usually it's a husband that passes away first, right? Wife is, is a survivor. She gets in a higher tax bracket. So not only does she potentially lose some income, right? Losing some social security, maybe losing some, some pension, right? Maybe some survivorship benefits, but still having to take money out of, out of the IRA, right? That still has to happen. So we're seeing income sometimes going down and we're seeing taxes going up. So looking at this, uh, I looked at this and calculated and the average person, the average person, when your spouse passes away, it is very realistic for the average person for your income taxes as, a, as the single person to, to double. But many times it can be over three times the amount. 
So why is that? Curtis is spot on. It's a single taxpayer rate. And so if, if you think about this, what is a major asset? Where, where do people put a, uh, where do they say, how do they save nowadays? So when they hit retirement, what's, what's something they put that money in? 401k, an IRA. When that money comes out, how much of that is taxable? It's all taxable. So as a surviving spouse, if you lose some pension, you lose some social security, where does the average surviving spouse go to make up that income? IRA, the 401k, it's all taxable. So you got more money coming out of an IRA. There's more tax to pay in a single taxpayer bracket. Does that make sense? So one of the things that, that Curtis does is one of the advisors at Cornerstone is he will sit with his clients and he will help them calculate this is what the future tax looks like for you personally for your income based upon your income sources. And this is what it looks like, say, when one of you passes away. This is what it looks like for the surviving spouse. He's been doing it too long to say whether that's good or bad. He just asks, how do you feel about that? And if you're good with it, stop. Don't do anything about it. But if you look and say, I didn't realize that, and I don't like that, then, then he talks to his clients about different strategies and what can you do. Here's one example. And that's, you're, you're, Roger, you're right about that webinar that we're, that we're having tonight. Uh, that we're talking about, the legislative risk, which is tax risk. What is the path that you're on with your retirement accounts? What does that look like? And realizing where we are today, we're historically, it might not feel like it, but we're in historically low tax bracket rates. Congress is fighting to increase taxes. Even if they do nothing, January 1, 2026, taxes are already slated to increase. So you have this, this ideal window possibly to do something about that, to possibly say, hey, how I take my income. Some of you call that Roth conversions, but it's really not just that. So think about it this way. Retirement, it is probably the first time in your life where you get to determine how much tax you pay. When you're working, every additional dollar of earned income, you pay tax on that, right? But you get a, you get a control. Say you wanted some extra money, say an extra $40,000, and you took it from an IRA, that's all taxable, right? But what if you took that 40000 from your savings account? That's tax-free, right? So see how you can control how much tax you pay in your retirement years. But a better way to do it is it's called income withdrawal sequence. How much money you take from here, how much you take from here, how much you take from here to create the ideal tax situation, not just this year, but long-term over your, your retirement, mapping out a plan so you pay the least amount in tax. Does that, does that make sense? So it's understanding, don't worry about taxes. You can't control that or tax rates. Focus on what you can control over your retirement years to reduce tax. If you reduce tax, what happens? You have to take less money from your investments. If you take less money from your investments because you're paying less in tax, don't you do a better job making that money last, making that money grow with me in that? It's things like that, that income withdrawal sequence that adds to that long-term financial security. So all of the buckets of money that we have to work with aren't equal. Absolutely. And probably not equal when we're a married couple versus being um, a surviving spouse from what you're saying. And, and IRA is, is literally the worst asset you could leave to your surviving spouse. That's what most people do, but it's the worst asset because when you pass away, your spouse is guaranteed to still have to take it out, might have to take out more, and is going to pay more in tax. Worst asset you can leave a surviving spouse. Thank you. So I think it was either this year in January or maybe last year, we had the truth about living longer and we talked about how we're all likely to live a lot longer than we think we will, which is a good thing. But the flip side of that is the concern about running out of money. Yeah. So just um, for those who might be concerned about running out of money, me, uh, what are some of the things in retirement that we could do or should be thinking about doing especially given everything sort of high at the moment, maybe we're making good money returns on our investments. You alluded to it a little bit earlier, but what should we be thinking about to maximize our situation? I think the big thing to think about is having a plan in place. You know, we've touched on various components, income plan, um, calories in, calories out, budget, what's coming in, what's paying our bills, investments, how are we invested? You know, what happens in a worst case scenario? We've had, what, a bull run in the market with the blip last year in the pandemic for 13 plus years. Um, what happens when we don't get those returns? What happens with taxes? So it's a, it's a comprehensive plan in place that kind of looks at everything as far as those strategies go to, to give you that peace of mind that, hey, my, my plan will work. Because there's no one silver bullet that's going to fix all of it. It's, it's kind of sitting down to address everything and looking at everything as a whole. Um, 
just to add to that, in my experience, I find that you need five things in retirement. And I wrote about this in, in my book. You need to have an income plan. You need to have an investment plan. Your investment plan should support your income plan. The third, you need to have a tax plan. You need to have a health care plan. And you need to have an estate plan. You need to have those five. Missing just one of those or not doing it correctly can, can mess up with the with the other, the other things. But how do you make sure that the path you're on is, is, is going to get you down the road? Kind of like what we talked about before. You map out, this is the income I want. Adjust it with inflation. These are my income sources. These are my investments. What is your plan? How are you going to take that? Social security, pension, factor that in. Let's take, I don't care about your best case. Let's take your worst case. How much can you lose? Let's factor that in. Let's run that. And you're looking for a red line. And I remember last week, I met with a couple and they had a red line. And the red line means that's the age that looks like you might run out of money if you had a market correction. And I asked him, how do you feel about that? Were you aware of that? Tell me your thoughts. And they said, we weren't aware of that. I'm glad we're here. Great. Okay, now we understand that we don't like that. But at least they understood their benchmark where they, where they were. And the question was, what can we do to improve our situation? So we looked and we said, income withdrawal sequence. If we can take the right money from the right buckets at the right time, we can stretch it out a few more years. That was number one. If we can reduce the risk here, even by maintaining the same rate of return, right? We reduce the potential loss next time we have a market correction. That was a few more years. Do you see that? So it's looking at those things, being able to say, hey, now let's run if we do those and what happens? And the red line basically went away. So it's understanding the path you're on, then specifically looking and saying, what are things that I can do? And if I tweak that, go back and look at this and you're looking to take that red line and push it farther down until it's non-existent, until an age where maybe it doesn't matter. So is it ever too late for us to plan? or revisit our plan. Maybe we have a plan today and we think it's a good plan and maybe I created the plan. Uh, is it ever too late to talk to someone else and make adjustments and corrections? Uh, I don't think it's ever too late. Um, anything can be changed. And if you have the perfect plan, great. I mean, there's, there's ways to test that. There's ways to say, hey, the path you're on is perfect. You don't need to make any changes, but it's never too late to make changes because there's always gonna be something we're unaware of. There's always gonna be a, a changing environment we don't take into consideration. So. No, I, I don't think it's ever too late to have that happen. You know, it, it depends what you're trying to accomplish, though. Right. So let's be honest. It depends what you're trying to accomplish. But I think in its, in its core, here's probably the biggest thing where it's never too late. And looking at where the economy is today, that the market, just about every asset is really high, isn't it? It doesn't tell you that means we're going to have a correction. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you we're way past due for one. We're way past due. And there's a lot of risk and, and, and it's expensive today. So the probably, I would say the most important thing, the most important thing for every single person in this room is to understand how much risk you are taking and if it's in line with your risk tolerance. And I would say nine times out of 10, the people that come into our office, for the vast majority of people, we're literally able to show them how to almost cut their risk in half yet still continue to earn those similar potential rates of return. Some people we can help them reduce risk. Most people we can help them reduce tax. But I think the most important one today is understand your risk exposure and if it's in line with your risk tolerance. Because at some point the market will come down as it does. Trees don't grow to heaven, right? They don't grow forever. And you never want to be stuck hearing from my industry when you say, wow, I didn't know I could lose that much. You do not want my industry sitting there and giving that standard garbage advice of, don't worry, hang in there, the market will come back because that's not advice and that doesn't do you any good. That's basically when my industry says, I don't have an answer for you. So it's never too late. And the most important thing is, under, I can't stress that enough, understand the risk you're taking, make sure it's aligned with your risk tolerance and understand how that would affect you long-term financially. Then you can make educated decisions moving forward. I'm just curious, out of the people you meet, how many are in, in a good place versus are taking too much risk or maybe not enough? 
Curtis, you want to take that? That's a, that's a trap. Um, no, I, I normally say, and there's risk on both. Yeah, so I can have absolutely giving a low return, and I think it's less risk absolutely. free. But sometimes, if the market changes, that fund suddenly takes a big hit. Can I just really quick? Can I fire away? I could talk forever. <laughs> We're good. I would say, I would say for easily. Uh, just the literally the vast majority of people we meet with are taking more risk than they think they're taking the vast majority day in day out the people that come in we help them to measure and understand what's your risk tolerance in your gut how much loss are you okay with the next time the market has a correction people can identify that but when we say how much risk are you taking your investments they usually say, I don't know. And we show them, this is your risk tolerance and this is your risk exposure. The vast majority of people, they're taking more risks than they realize and they don't know that. So I'd say the vast majority. Really? Of people. Even though they think they're low risk with what they're doing. Yeah. 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 And I think there's another component of that too. Um, you know, sometimes you're taking a lot of risk. And what, what we see is, when you have a significant amount of risk, you may not be getting the rate of return that you should be getting for the amount of risk you're taking. Think about like driving a car. If you're going to drive 100 miles per hour, you'd expect to get somewhere faster than driving 35 miles per hour. So it's, it's also very common to see where someone has, has a some higher risk than what they're comfortable with, but they're also not earning a fair rate of return for the risk they're taking. So that's another consideration, I think, to keep in mind. Thank you. So I'm not risk-free by just putting my money in an index fund with you know, one of the financial institutions. That's not sufficient planning. I'm missing something. That's not an investment strategy. If, if you and Frank Lloyd Wright were going to build a home, who's going to do a better job? Now, I'm sure, Brett, you're going to do a, a great job, but I'm, I'm going to bet my money on Frank Lloyd Yeah, my money no, okay. on him too, having seen what he's built. <laughs> having stuff in an investment portfolio is not an investment strategy. And just like this couple I met with yesterday, I showed them, I said, all of your holdings, they had bonds, they had, they had equity stocks, they had that eh, the regular stuff. But I showed them all of their holdings. When COVID went down last year, remember that in March? When COVID went down, every single one of their holdings in their investment portfolios went down. That's not an investment strategy, that's hope. And hope is not a strategy, right? Because then you're hoping the market will come back quickly. Does that make sense? That's not an investment strategy. As we tell our clients, right, Roger? I want you to know what you own and why you own it. And two things will happen. Either the market will go up or the market will go down. And what is your plan to manage that and take advantage of, of, of market, market drops? So just holding stuff? No, that's not an investment strategy. So at a minimum, sounds like we should all go back, look at what we have. And if the market was to change, which you guys are saying is going to happen at some point, what's my exposure? How much is that going to hurt? Right. And if you don't like right it, thing? if you don't like what you find, change it. Right. Yeah. And then as far as changing it, so is there anything stopping us going back to whoever our advisor is and having a conversation with them about if the market goes south at some point, what does that look like for me? Is that a conversation we should be having if we're not already? I... We go through, I, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I would tell you this, this, the industry that we're in, the financial industry, there, there's two parts of this. And I believe if I educate people, people make wiser, better decisions. One side is the brokerage industry. The brokerage industry does not, is, is not required to always put your interest first. If the product is suitable, if it's okay, they can sell it to you. If there's a conflict of interest, that's okay. They don't have to disclose all those fees. It doesn't have to be the best in class. So that, that's one you're dealing with. Then you have what's known as the registered investment advisor side. That means that's someone that has a fiduciary responsibility to be transparent with you, to not have a conflict, do what's in your best interest and always provide best in class. Does that make sense? What's important is that you understand the two. And you have to ask the question, do I want to get advice from someone who is required by law to put my interests ahead of their own? That's a question that each person should ask on their own. Based upon that, that would then direct you towards, yes, I want to work with the brokerage industry, or I want to work with someone who's a registered investment advisor 
who has a fiduciary responsibility to you individually? That's how I would answer that question. Then assess where you get your advice from and is that appropriate for you? So if I'm not sure with the organization I'm working with, how do I find out if they're a registered investment advisor versus a brokerage? Is, that is, is a red flag obvious? right there. It, it, again, if you don't know the risk exposure that you're, you're, you're taking, that is a red flag. If you don't know if you're taking, if you don't have an income withdrawal strategy, how you're taking your investments, how, how you're taking your income in a tax efficient manner, if you don't know if you're doing that, that's an issue. If you don't know if you're working with someone that has a fiduciary responsibility to you, those, those are red, red flags. I find that people that know they're wor are working with a fiduciary, they know they're working with a fiduciary. So that would be some red flags there. I would certainly ask those questions. I, I would ask. I would ask and say, are you a fiduciary? Are you, are you required to put my interest first? If so, get that in writing. Make sure you get that in writing. But if you don't know, I would say that's a red flag. You, you might not be. Anything you wanted to add to that? Good. No, I think that nails it. Yep. I, I think the key on that is having an open conversation. If you can't have an open conversation with, with your professionals, your advisor, that, that's, that is, that, that's scary. You should have that comfortability, that communication, just like anything in life. So what would your tips be if someone like me doesn't have a great uh, fiduciary? Where do I go to find one? How do I... Other than you guys, you, you're you, great, but how, how do you, how, how I would I, you, I don't want to use you, I want to find someone, yeah. of course I'd use you. I, I think you want us to self-promote ourselves and it's just not what we, what we do. No, we're not here to self-promote. Yeah, but, yeah, I don't want to do that. I, you, I want to help the audience, so if you don't have, yeah. how do I find someone I'm going to be able to trust and who is a fiduciary? To me, identify the phase of life you're in. If you're in that retirement phase, I would highly recommend you work with someone that specializes in retirement, right? To under, so talking about understanding risk, income withdrawal sequence, tax planning, those types of things. Make sure you're working with someone that has that, that experience. If you, don't, if you don't see that, just ask them, who are the clients that you normally work with? Ask if they have a fiduciary responsibility. Ask the, the recommendations that you're making to me. How does that fit in line with my risk tolerance? Uh, if if uh, the recommendations that you're providing to me, how does that fit in line with helping me to pay less in tax? Those are some of the questions you should be asking. Uh, on my website, which is cornerstoneway.com, if you go to the bottom right corner, there's a resources tab. And if you click on it, there's one that says five questions to ask. Download it, it's free, print it out. Those five questions, you should ask each advisor that you interview, those five, ask others if you want, but ask those consistent five questions. Use that as you go through the process. Meet with multiple uh, financial professionals to find the right one for you. But those five questions, those are the core ones you should ask. Uh, when, you, when you're done, sit back, look at the answer to those questions, and that should help you find the right advisor for, for you. And can you just repeat that website one more time, just yes. more slowly for those who would like to go and find that resource? Cornerstoneway.com, W-A-Y, cornerstoneway.com. In the bottom right corner, there's a resources request tab. In that, uh, just select the one that says five questions to ask. And it's free. You can just download it. And it gives you five questions you should ask. And you should do your homework. You should meet with multiple financial professionals. Ask those five questions consistently. And that will help you zero in on the, right, on the one that's right for you. Thank you. So another question I had just following up from that is, so I, I find an advisor, but now I'm kind of concerned. I'd don't feel I have the knowledge to know what to ask. So you gave me five questions that I can use to try to help select someone, mm -hmm. but I don't know what I don't know. So it's kind of a rhetorical question, but if I just started watching your program on Sunday nights over a period of time, because it's every week, yeah. would that increase my knowledge to now know some questions and raise some things I hadn't thought about? You know, it's interesting. I help people to retire and I can tell you, I would fail in retirement. I would not know what to, I would not know what to I will, just like my dad, I, I will die with my boots on. I enjoy what I do. And that's what this TV show is about. The, the stories and the people that I meet with, that we meet with on a regular daily, weekly, monthly basis, the people that come in our office, that's where those topics come from. And it's designed to educate you, empower you, and help you to make 
smarter, wiser decisions. So uh, the, the show is there, been doing it for 16 seasons, take advantage of it. It's my hope that it helps you to make wiser, better decisions and be able to live your retirement dreams, live your best life. And how much does it cost me to watch that show each Sunday? Very, very expensive, Free. very expensive. <laughs> Free. Does anyone watch it? I'm just curious. Oh, good. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'd encourage everybody because you'll learn. I've watched a number of them and yeah, you always pick up something else. It's like I wasn't even aware of that, especially now with all the changes that are going on as far as, you know, inflation and tax changes and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. And actually it's on the second page of your handout on the back. I put down um, resources and I've referenced Chris's show because I think it's phenomenal. And it's just like what we do here. It's just providing great free information because we don't know what we don't know. So at the beginning, I kind of asked about uh, our mindset as far as spending money, and we touched on it a little bit. For those who of us who have parents and grandparents who grew up in the Depression era, and we've learned to just save, save, save. Um, I have a fear there's people that have means, and there's things that they'd like to do, but are not giving themselves permission to go and do that, whether it's to uh, better the quality of their life, whether it's to find enjoyment, um, basically to improve their situation in some way. Uh, it might be moving house to something that's more manageable. It might be going on that trip. It might be making a donation. And I know you said we can't change our habits, but I respectfully kind of disagree. I think we can change our habits if we work on it and put our mind to it. <laughs> true, true. What advice would you give to those people who have maybe been wanting or thinking about doing things and have kind of put it on hold? And at night, as we work with people who are aging, we often find people who are in an environment that's no longer manageable, it's not bringing them joy. And we know that they would be much happier somewhere else in one of our wonderful communities that we have. Um, but they're worried about the money part of it. And in some cases, it doesn't cost them any more to make a lateral a move. Um, but they're just worried about any money going out because I might run out of money. What would you say to those people to try to help change mindset to at least look at what their options are? And take it or no. go okay again okay. these are that's trap and I can, and the <laughs> is, depression no I, i'm, I'm that, that, it's kind of personal to me because i had two yeah. uncles if i can just share a little bit that were very wealthy um when they passed away they were both farmers they owned big huge properties back in australia one was a big sheep farmer one was a cattle farmer if uh 15 years ago you ever went into costco and bought lamb it probably come from my uncle's property he had something like sixty thousand acres of property tens and tens of thousands of sheep. They'd bring in 50 shearers every year to shear all the sheep. The wool would get it exported around the world. Some sheep would end up coming over here. Costco and so forth were a buyer. And my uncle, uh, he was my godfather. So it's kind of, um, he always said to my auntie Irene, my uncle was Kevin, that when we retire, we'll go on trips. We'll go and do things. And my aunt, she worked. She fed all these shearers all those years. And... Uh, they were financially well off, but they never spent. You know, they'd go to the Salvation Army to buy clothes just to save money, but they didn't need to. There's all this money in the bank account. And my uncle ended up with Parkinson's disease and it developed really quickly and they never got to do any of those things. And my aunt, um, she's not in good physical condition now to even be able to do them on her own. So I just see that really sad, what a missed opportunity if they realized what they had to be able and gave themselves permission to go and enjoy some of it. Um, yeah, my cousins have done really well. They've inherited you know, a fortune. But yeah, my uncle and auntie, my godparents, they just totally missed out. They worked so hard all their lives. And I know there were things that they wanted to do, but they never gave themselves permission. So how would you, what would you say to people who are in a position to do something to try to help them make use of what they have? Yeah, I, and I've got so many stories of that, that also. I think where we, where we bring value to the table is help people to envision identify how much income do you want and it's simply projecting that out of what that looks like now remember that, that I, I told you about that couple that i just met with and she gave me a smaller number and she realized okay this is possible you literally see that in her body language and i encourage her to say hey let's go back let's talk about dreaming these are things you told me that was important to you travel to europe they started listing off these things going and visiting their kids or grandchildren things like that and uh, she was able to start saying, hey, okay, all right, I can, I can identify, well, maybe this number. She turns, she starts talking to her husband, maybe this is our number. And I said, hey, we can absolutely project that. 
You tell me what that number is. We'll run that back in there and project what that looks like. And you could see that they had the freedom to start talking and dreaming. So it's not that we tell our clients to spend the money, but we want them to see what their current path looks like, what is possible, what's achievable, and help them to dream. And when we typically get back together, what we say is, hey, here's what we heard from you. Here's what you want your retirement to look like and be able to show them what that is. Um, but you, you hit on something else that I, you kind of brought up and then you, you, I think you backed away from, but I want to point that out. I, I saw some of these services out here and, and this, this speaking event that you do and the services that you offer, they're, they're huge because I have seen people that don't take advantage of those things. And they, unfortunately, they don't downsize. They don't go through their things. And I've seen the problems and the burden that it puts on the shoulders of their family that they leave behind. And I have seen the difference where people come in and say, you know what? I want to make that change. I want to downsize to something that makes more sense to me. I don't want to deal with those burdens. And I've seen them take advantage of those services and the difference that it makes for that freedom to be able to go and, and live and enjoy. But I will, I will, I want to tell you this. Here was a, I watched this and I watched these, there were five couples and uh, they were, you know, they're, they're since older, um, they don't travel anymore, but they used to travel together as a couple. And there was one, um, one, one couple, their friends, they were not clients. And these other four were. And as time went on, what I found was that these four, they were making better financial decisions than this couple that wasn't. As time went on, you know, they kept inviting these people, go on a trip, go out with us, go do those things. And these people started to do it less and less because they were worried about financially, whether they could or not. And over time, they, these people start, stopped inviting these people because they felt, hey, are we offending them by inviting them on something that maybe they possibly can't afford? And that's over time caused it, they didn't mean to, but caused a separation in that. And again, it just goes back to saying, hey, what is possible? Can I do this? Can I spend and enjoy this way? Um, and what does it look like long term? Being able to map that out and say, hey, how do I feel about that? And your assets are nothing more than your resources and aligning them with what's important to you, what your, what your values are in life. Thank you, Chris. And I guess the point I'd want to make to that is that it's not about being able to go on trips or $40,000 on golf, heaven forbid. It's just using the resources we have. It might be going out to a, a dinner or a coffee or a because you know, we're all in different places and have different resources, but Absolutely. just being able to use what we have, whatever that might be, versus not taking advantage of it. Right. Yeah. Do you have anything you wanted to add, Curtis? No, I, no I'm pretty good. That, that, that nailed it. No, I, Chris says it all. I'm good. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's, I it's won't perfect. Do that again. No, you're, you're So if we, on our second page, uh, I think we put down a list of three actions. So if the audience were to work, walk away today with just one action that they could take to improve our situation or to just revisit and make sure we're on the right path, and you've already said it, but could you just more, again, just repeat what the one thing everyone should do in your, in your humble opinion? Rejected. You're fine. <laughs> no, go ahead. Sure. I, You're much more eloquent than I am, so please. Well, just so you know, Curtis, and I'm going to ask you for one. Okay, you got it. Based upon, again, where the economy today, where it is today, I would say the most important thing that you could focus on is to understand the risk you're taking. Understand your risk exposure. Is it in line with your risk tolerance? If it is, ask the next question, hey, am I earning a fair return for that? But I would say the most important one is understand the risk you're taking and if it's in line with your risk tolerance. I would say that's your action step right there. Most important thing you probably do. Thank you. I'd Good. say the next action step is talk to somebody about those things you may not be aware of, the, those hidden traps. Like we talked about taxes, um, the single surviving spouse. There's things that we all don't know. And, and if you don't ask questions or you don't have an open line of communication with somebody, there's going to be things you miss. So I would say, make sure you're talking to whomever it may be about things you may be missing, because if you don't see it, it can bite you and you don't want to have that happen. How many spots did we get? Was it two or three? Three. We need a third one. Ready for a third? So we talked about risk, right? We talked about tax, being tax smart. Um, we have a 
if you want, we have a webinar coming up that we're gonna talk about some of the, the, the tax changes that Congress is, is, is focusing on, some of the legislative risk and how it might affect you. But taxes, I absolutely agree where, where we are today. And I would say the third, as a retiree, I'm gonna call it that income withdrawal sequence. Now we talked about where you take your income from will have a direct impact on the tax you pay this year and long-term in the future. So income withdrawal sequence is taking money from those different streams of income. Could be social security, could be pension, could be IRA distributions. How you take money from those different sources and put that together will have obviously an immediate impact on the taxes you pay this year and long-term in the future. That would be your, your third one, income withdrawal sequence. Great, great advice. So I'd like to open it up to audience uh, questions in just a moment, but just before we do, is there anything that I've missed asking you that um, you wanted to cover that's important in relation to today's topic? I could talk forever. I on know you stuff, could. <laughs> but I, I won't. Thank you for having us. Oh, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything, Curtis? No, thank no, you. We, we covered everything that we <laughs> said. Out to, you know, fantastic. I'm sure we have lots of questions. I do just want to acknowledge all of our education partners that are in the room. It's great to have you all back here in person. And as... Chris alluded to, take advantage of the resources that we have here every month, whether it's what the cost would be of moving into a retired living community, the cost of in-home care, knowing what the services are available, a reverse mortgage kind of fits into finance today. We have a reverse mortgage expert here. Just knowing your options, talk to all of our education partners, find out what they do, how they fit into retirement, and how they could be of benefit to you. And if it's something that you might think that's a possibility in the future, how does that fit into your financial plan? Talk to your financial advisor about that and how that fits in. So yeah, please just take advantage of our partners who come every month. Um, they're here for you as a resource. So let's jump to questions. Are we ready, Alexa? I guess we need some mics. I need a couple of... Uh... Oh, are we going to do a seminar next month? <laughs> oh, that's a good question too. Yeah, so our next seminar is on December the 16th, the truth, the truth about finding purpose after retirement. And I'm really excited about this one too, because we're gonna have two uh, phenomenal speakers coming from uh, the School of Medicine at UNR, Sanford Center for Aging. And they're gonna to talk to us about what finding purpose in retirement means. And it's not gonna be what you expect. So Alexa, if you could launch the poll for that, for those people who are on Zoom. And for the people in the room, if you would like to attend that seminar on your yellow evaluation form, there's a box there that you can check if you'd like to come along and we'll get you registered. Do we have another mic? Uh, Maria? Magic. Don't do it, Roger. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm going to be polite with Curtis and uh, Chris, but my question, and I'm certain everyone in this group is asking for our buckets of money, how can we stay ahead of inflation? And Chris said, too much money chasing too few products. And uh, the old adage, uh, follow the money, and the trillions of dollars that are being printed have to find a home. And uh, if somebody walked into Cornerstone two years ago and they say, I've got this bucket of money, I'm conservative, I'd be happy with a five, 10% rate of return. And today they walk in and say, I'm still conservative. I still would be happy with a five to a 10% rate of return, but I, I don't get it because where are the investments out there that can protect us from inflation, medical, the CPI deal of 3% a year is a falsehood. Uh, every one of us have filled up our gas tanks recently. So where do we put our money to stay ahead of inflation? That's what I don't understand. All right. uh, can I answer that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. I, I certainly can't. So <laughs> <laughs> let's look at the market as a, as a whole. The market has earned about 18%, over 18% a year for the last five years. And let's say your goal was to earn... I don't know, let's use simple math. Let's say you were trying to earn 10% a year for the last five years, right? 50%. And let's say in years one, two, and three, you averaged about a 17% return. That's 50%, right? Well, then year four and five, if you earned zero, you still have earned your 50%, haven't you? Is it okay 
to reduce risk and maybe say I've already earned that return and simply take risk and we'll say year four and five, or you're better off to just stomp on the gas and continue to take as much risk as possible. So with that, this is what we tell our clients. There is a time to make money and there's a time not to lose money. So it's not that the answer is to be on the, the sidelines, but it comes back in understanding your risk tolerance. And I would tell you, whatever your risk tolerance is, it means that you're, you should be leaning away. You should be taking less risk. And if you're taking less risk, it's more about protecting and not losing, and then being able to use that dry powder to be able to benefit from the next time the market has a correction. So the correct answer is not always just stomping on the gas, but understanding your risk tolerance. And I will tell you the problem in my industry is they, they tell you to focus on return first and never understand risk. Then the market corrects and you say, I didn't know I could lose that much. Let's reverse those, right? Let's focus on risk management first, return second. Therefore, the next time the market has a correction, we know what we would lose. We know how it would affect us. And if we're okay, if we don't like it, make that change. And as long as we focus on risk first and we do that correctly, returns will always follow. Does that make sense? So there's a time to make money, time not to, time not to lose money. And I would tell you in today's environment, it's understanding your risk and you should look at your portfolio and you should be leaning away some, taking less risk today. Now, if the market continues to go up, you will still benefit from that. Does that make sense? You will still benefit from it, but if the market comes down, you have a strategy to also benefit from a correction in the market. Does that, does that make sense? That answer your question, right? Chris, it makes some sense, but your crystal ball, I'm looking at inflation five to 10 years ahead. So right. manage the risk, but if the inflation is a constant for five, six, seven, eight years, Correct. Uh, I'm trying to understand what asset classes you can put your money in and protect yourself and still manage the risk. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be careful without giving you a very specific black and white recommendation, because as a fiduciary, I'm not supposed to do that to a general audience. Um, but if you focus on, let's say, two asset classes, which would be equities and fixed income, right? Let's say the average Let's say the typical retiree maybe has 50% in equities and 50% in bonds, right? Now, as a general rule, we want to hold the best quality in the most efficient manner, right? The problem is, as the market has continued to go up, 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 you might find that you have 60 or 70% in equity and a lot smaller percentage in bond. You're over your skis. You're taking too much risk. The next time the market has a correction, you will probably lose more than you thought. So as the market's going up, if you're managing risk and understanding what your risk tolerance is, you would be moving the other direction. You would be selling high. You might be saying, hey, I only have 40% equity, 60% bond, holding less risk. In that, you would still be earning very nice returns as the market has gone up. If the market continues to go up, you'll still see some nice returns. But if the market is a correction, you're not going to lose a lot. And you have this dry powder to take advantage of that. Is that, is that what you are recommending for the majority of your clients that want to manage that risk? What we rec with, without giving a specific recommendation, because as a fiduciary, I can't do that in a general audience. I, I can tell you what I what we do recommend is to understand that risk tolerance. And once we understand the risk tolerance, we can make sure that the risk exposure is in line with that. And what that means is how much equity exposure do we have is measured by how much risk we're willing to take. And then the bond component simply becomes that dry powder to lean in and to buy low if the market comes down. So simply put, full disclosure, I hope we have a market correction because we are well prepared to take advantage of that and benefit from that. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Great question, Roger. Thank you, Chris. Uh, to the back, then we'll come over here. Earlier, Chris, you mentioned that there are no taxes on savings account when you withdraw. Can you, I'm having trouble understanding that sure. one. Sure. We were talking about an income withdrawal sequence and we use the example that if we wanted I think we said $40,000, we wanna take money from somewhere. If we took it from our IRA, all of that 40,000 is taxed as ordinary income. 
right? Coming out of an IRA, it's tax deferred, so it's all taxable. If we took money out of, let's say, a savings account, an after-tax savings account, you're right that the interest, the earnings on the savings would be taxable. I was saying if we took 40,000 from a savings account, we've already paid tax on that. So if we took that 40,000 out and spent that, we wouldn't pay tax on that money. Yeah, sorry about that, I just need to clarify that. It seems like if you have a big chunk of money in high grade dividend stocks, you have both inflation protection and if there's a market downturn, you still have the dividends, even if the market goes down. So as long as you have a couple of other income streams, uh, social security, some other passive income from a pension or IRA or whatever, you're pretty well protected in the case of a market downturn. Is that correct? Take that or you want to take it? Go for it. <laughs> um, what it's a great question. What you're saying is, hey, if I have sufficient income coming from, let's say, pension, social security, and I have some assets generating some dividend, I believe I'm okay. You may be right, you may be wrong. Here are a few thoughts. Uh, number one, if I go back to 2008, uh, take uh, I take Bank of America, right? Bank of America was paying a great dividend before 2008 happened. Their dividend pretty much went to zero, pretty much went to zero. If I, re, I, I might be off on this, but I remember a client came in before 2008, they had 500,000 of Bank of America stock. It was worth 500,000 and paying a huge dividend. In 2008, I think the stock, it, it dropped. It was, I don't remember exactly, but it's just a huge, huge loss. I mean, I think it was wasn't it less than 100,000 at that time and the income just went to zero. So their income dried up, but they couldn't sell the investment because it wasn't worth a whole lot. They were just kind of stuck. So it's understanding, hey, the dividends that I, I have, how would they be impacted if we had another type of, I'm not saying we're going to have a 2008, but kind of looking back historically, what happens to those dividends that I have? That would be question number one to ask. Number two, there's a report you can Google. It's called Advisor Alpha. A Vanguard did this study, Advisor Alpha. And one of the things it was doing, it was asking, there are different types of ways that you can invest. And one of those is a dividend-based portfolio. And they weren't saying it was good or bad. They're simply asking the question, in today's environment where interest rates are low and, and the, the, the stock market is very high, from a risk standpoint, is that still a good way to invest? And what they're saying is it's okay, but you're actually taking more risk to earn that rate of return. And what that advisor alpha study is really saying is the total return type of portfolio where you have a total return, where you're focusing on dividends, interest, capital gain as a whole. To, but to bring it down and make this very simple, I would say this. There's a simple formula. And it, it basically TR is total return equals D plus I, which is dividend and interest plus or minus gains or loss. So if you look at your dividends and interest, your pension, your income, the question you're asking is, as long as my income needs uh, are provided through pension, social security, and dividends, I don't need to sell the stock. And I would agree with that. If you look historically and see that those stocks that have gone down, dividends have gone down, and your income might or your income might go low enough, so you might have to sell some of that stock, follow me, to, to make up for your income, you have a risk that you might have to sell it low. And when the market comes back, you have fewer shares, you don't come back to where you were before. So I think the question would be, if we did experience that loss, a drop in dividends, do you have to sell some of the stock or can you tighten your belt? Second question is, do you really want to tighten your belt anyway if you don't have to? Does that, does that answer that question? Great question. Yeah. Thank you. The IRS limits us to about $16,000 a year to give to an offspring or anybody else. Uh, one of the rules and regulations governing generation skip gifting. You can do Wanting to give okay. the kids more than that amount without Great. their avoiding taxing. What you're first referring to is the annual exclusion. Yep, you can give this dollar amount, the $16,000 to each person. I assume you're married, so that means you and your spouse give $32,000 to your daughter. Assuming your daughter is 
married, that means you could give, you as a married couple could give $64,000 to your daughter and her husband. You follow how that number can, can grow and you can use that. Now, if you want to give a larger amount, there's two different things, right? When you talk about a generation skip, the first issue is if your estate is large enough, you have an estate tax. That limit is extremely high. I think it's about what, $22 million right now. As a general rule, if you want to give a million dollars, you should be okay in terms of literally just giving a million and there's no gift tax on it. There's no estate tax. Now, again, I would speak with your financial advisor or your estate planning attorney on that. Don't just take my advice. I don't know your specific situation, but generally you should be able to just write a check of a million and avoid any tax on that. The generation skip, uh, if you have a large enough estate and you have a state tax, the issue is you pass away, you must pay this estate tax, which is about 40% over the limit. You pass it to your kids, they grow it, they pass away, and they pay another 40% over that limit. That's a large, that's a tax on a tax. So a generation skip is estate planning designed to skip a generation. So you could put a chunk of money in a trust, you pass away and you say, my children can take income on that for life. And when they pass away, it ultimately goes to the grandchildren and you have skipped a generation of taxation. Does that make sense? The interest, Wait, is, the, problem. the interest is giving them a chunk now and not having to worry about their being taxed or my being taxed. Right. So it is, you're right that a 16,000 married couple, double it to 32. If they're married, you can double that to 64. But as a general rule, you could give a million dollars to them today. Talk with your estate planning attorney first. You should be able to give about a million dollars and not have any type of estate tax um, or or um, gift tax on that. We have some questions from some people at home. And Kerry here has one too. Oh, Kerry. Okay. Uh, Gary at home, since an IRA is high taxes for surviving spouse, what investment should I move to now? If I move an IRA to an annuity, will it still be taxed? Short answer on that, yes, it will still be taxed. Um, IRA is a tax classification. doesn't matter what the investment is, whether it's an annuity, ETF, stock bond, doesn't matter. Um, as Chris spoke earlier, one of the things to look at if you have an IRA as a high tax now is the IRA exit strategy, whether you're spending it. Uh, Roth conversion strategy is another one to look at. Um, I have a client that chooses to have some charitable interest. So that required distribution can go towards charity to a certain limit. So there's various things you can look at, but switching from one investment tool, stocks, bond, portfolio to annuity won't get rid of that tax classification. Can I add, add yep, to that? Please, Chris. Um, the, the question is, uh, how do I uh, I have money in an, an IRA and I'm trying to, uh, if I pass that to my spouse, how do I reduce or eliminate the tax? In my experience, I find the right way to do it is, is an analysis. Just like you go to the doctor, the doctor says, tell me the symptoms, they run some tests, they come back and give you some recommendations. So my recommendation, one of the things we do is we just do a side-by-side -side analysis. What is the tax based on your current path? You're taking maybe your required distributions or what have you, uh, you pass away, what is left to your spouse? What is the tax on that? Let's first make sure that that is a tax problem in your situation. If it is, assuming it is, then on the other side of this, this analysis, the other side of the page, we can look and say, is there a more efficient way to remove that from the IRA? For example, would it make sense to start taking some money out and let's say putting that into maybe a Roth where that money would come out, you'd have to pay tax on it and then move that money into a Roth, and then that money could come out tax-free for your wife. So doing a side-by-side -side to make sure that you can benefit from it. The other thing you asked is using an annuity. An annuity will not eliminate the tax. And as long as interest rates are low, I would generally say that annuity is, is, is typically a poor solution just because they're affected by, by interest rates. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carrie McKinney from Mutual of Omaha Mortgage, one of the sponsors of, of today's seminar. And I just want to reinforce, we're, we're doing reverse mortgages. That's the backup strategy when you failed to have a plan or when your plan <laughs> otherwise failed. Uh, 
so I heartily endorse everything you've done, everything you've talked about today, Chris. The question is, I meet with clients all the time who need a reverse mortgage because they never wanted to think about the money. I just can't, la, 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 you start talking numbers and I just can't, I can't think about it. I can't face it. I'm afraid to face it. What do I do? What do I do? Well, you know, we're the backup strategy. You're the forward strategy. How, how do you overcome, like if your spouse is the one that is, I, I don't want to talk about money. I just can't think about it. I just can't deal with it. How do you overcome that reluctance to talk about a plan? Well, sometimes I will have one spouse. It's a great question. And I've seen this too many times. Sometimes I will literally have one spouse that comes in without the other one. And I'll have that honest conversation. I, I think it's an 800 pound gorilla. And I tell them, look, I've been married for 27 years to the love of my life. I would not make a, 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 a financial decision or any decision. I wouldn't make a decision without my wife. I value what my wife has to say. And I, I ask them how they feel about that. And what they generally do is they agree and they agree to next time we'll get back again and we'll bring that other spouse to that meeting. And we have this conversation and it looks like this. I ask that spouse, what's important to you? And one of the things we find out is, hey, what's important to you about money? What does money mean to you? What, what are your first experiences about money? Sometimes we find they're, they're afraid of it. Sometimes we find that and let's find out where that person is coming from, where they are, and then what they want, what is important to them. A lot of times they don't care about the details. A lot of times they want to know, hey, if something happens to this person who makes those decisions, am I going to be okay? And we find out at what level do they want to understand, but make sure that they are respected and part of the conversation at the level where they want to be. And then we know, hey, who are the decision makers? Who's involved? Who do we need to plan for? What's important to them? What are the goals and concerns? And how do we move forward in that, in that direction? Great question. Yeah, uh, there's so much advertisements on investing in gold and silver, and we all should have gold and silver. What What is your opinion on that? Well, no, gold and silver, I, I think, historically trades on fear. So when people are scared, they run to the precious metals, gold and silver. Um, Chris may have something to add to this as well, but you know, a small amount of gold and silver, a physical amount, I, I think is fine. You know, if you start to get in the weeds a little bit of, of notes and things like that, if it's tangible asset and you have it, great. Um, I always tell my clients, though, if you're having, you know, a mini Fort Knox in your house, probably not something you want to do. But but a little bit of the tangible physical asset, I would say, is okay. Um, but typically, precious metals are going to trade on fear. So when people get scared or the economy is going down, that's where you see the run. I agree. If you look at the uh, historical return of the last 20, 10 to 20 years of gold, for the most part, it really hasn't gone anywhere. But I will tell you about gold. I think gold is a great investment. Go and buy it. Go put it on your wife's neck. That's my belief. <laughs> yeah, I, Curtis is absolutely right. If you buy gold, the, when do you sell it? Well, the idea is if you buy gold, you're hoping that the person after you is more afraid than you are. You see that? And then you're going to sell it to them and, and, and make money. That, that is the concept. But historically, gold is not, um, you're not making a whole bunch of money with, with gold. If you look at the historical returns of the last 10 or 20 years, you're just not. And yes, there's a lot of commercials out there. And I absolutely agree because that is not an investment strategy. If you want to buy some gold and, and put in your safe because it makes you feel better, got a lot of clients to do that, great. All the more power to you. I personally, full disclosure, do not. Um, so I'm not a big believer in gold because it's not an investment class and all the data says it complicates your portfolio and over time it actually brings your return down. So why bother with it? Just go buy your wife some jewelry and everyone wins. <laughs> You're up for that, Ricky? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Craig's taking you shopping after this and he's going to go buy you some nice gold to wear. Uh, my question is... Uh, U.S. is in danger again of defaulting on this loan. How would, if that happens, how would that affect our savings and investments? Do you want to take it or would you like me to take it? Okay. 
the government, the United States government has the ability to print and tax. Follow me? So a dollar is basically worth what we believe it is or what the government says it is. So we need to under, understand that. So it's difficult for the government to default if they can print and tax. Now, if they print and tax, we call that in inflation, right? We call that in, that in, that inflation. So I, I don't believe the fear is that the government is going to default on their, uh, on their, their promises in that regard, because they can simply print more money. But I will tell you this, I think this is the real issue. Um, David Walker was the former comptroller of the United States government. So he was like the, the, the country's CPA. He retired and he wrote a book called Come Back America. You don't have to read it. I'm going to tell you exactly what he said. He basically said the path that we're on is unsustainable. If we continue down this path, we will add to our federal debt by one to $2 trillion a year. We're at $28 trillion today. We have passed that the total GDP or debt is bigger than that. That, is, that was the last time we were there was basically World War II, but that was a whole different issue. He said, if we continue down this path till we hit about $50 trillion, there will only be enough money to pay interest on the debt and basically the other basic things, meaning you're, you're, you've got your Medicare, your Social Security. There's going to be no money for anything else. So that is clearly an unsustainable path. So something must happen in that, in that regard. With that, I don't believe you can control that. I, my concern, how are we going to fix that? I believe the answer is taxes will go up. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight on that, on that webinar in terms of that legislative risk. How might this impact you? What are some things that you should, that you should consider doing? Great question. Can I decide, is that just a webinar for your clients or is, is anyone able to? Or? Anyone's able. I would, pro I would simply call our office if you wanted to do that. I personally, I don't, I don't recommend as a retiree, you start your day going to a speaking event and your day going to a speaking event. So, you know, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have one from Maria at home. What kind of cost can we expect for getting the quality financial guidance that our speakers are suggesting about today? How do you, I mean? In my experience, um, when you work with a registered investment advisor, you're usually around 1% a year total. It, it should typically be based upon the, uh, it should be tiered. The more assets you have, the, the more that, that cost should go down. When you're looking to hire someone in my industry, it's pretty simple. If you see that you can do it on your own, you should fire them and just do that. Does that, does that make sense? That's, that's rule number one. Rule number two, what I would recommend is that you have an analysis done and you're asking the question, what am I currently paying? You should have them provide that to you and say in writing, what are you going to charge? What are you going to do for me? And you and only you alone can determine if that's a fair value. In my experience, for the average person that comes to us, we're usually able to cut the risk almost in half still sometimes increase their returns or maybe just maintain similar returns and help them to pay less in tax. If at a minimum, if your advisor cannot show you that they're bringing you sufficient value to either increase your returns, save you that money in tax, they're not worth the money. My dad told me something a long time ago that good planning shouldn't cost you money, it should save you money. If that person can't save you at least what they're charging, do not hire that person. Great question. Great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we still have a few more at home. Um, from Kathy. Oh, thanks. And for those at home, if you wish to speak and be heard in the room, um, you can just click on the raise your hand, raise your hand yes. button. Or if you're on a phone, I know there's some people who are dialed in. If you press star nine on your phone, um, we, we can unmute you too. Everyone in the room can hear. Okay. So from Kathy, I will be required to take my RMD next year. Are there options to minimize or reduce my taxes since I will be put into another tax bracket? The first one I can think of coming to mind is if you have any charitable intent, some of that required distribution can go towards charity. That will avoid the income tax to you. Of course, it'll go straight to charity. You don't get the benefit from it, um, but that is one reason, uh, one way you can. You're, you're spot on. There, there, I don't know your situation, but I'll share one. Um, as a general rule, the sooner you address planning, the better off you are. One of the problems I see is that everyone tells you to put money in these retirement accounts. 
Your financial advisor says put money in those retirement accounts. Your employer said put money in those retirement accounts. They'll even match it. Right? Your CPA says do it and get the tax deduction. Everyone tells you to put money in your retirement accounts. I seem like the only person that's saying don't do that. It's not that it's bad, but it's kind of like, is that first cookie okay? Yeah. How about the second cookie? How about the third? At a certain point, you shouldn't have 10 cookies, right? Maybe one's okay, maybe two. It's the same thing. Is it possible that you could actually be putting too much money in your retirement account? So just as, as you asked, that now it's pushing you in a higher tax bracket. Does that make sense? Understand the path that you're on. Now with that, there's so many different ways to go about it. I'm going to share a cool story. This couple, they, they came in, they, they had money in an IRA. And it was going to, the money coming out was going to put them in a higher tax bracket. And I think in this situation, just like this, they didn't need the money. How blessed are they? What do we do? They didn't want to do Roth conversions. We listened to them. And this was Curtis's client. And what Curtis picked up on from them was that family is important to them. So we shared one story with them. Now it worked for them. I'm not recommending you do this, but it worked for them. Family was important. He, he recommended, they spoke with their CPA. They went out and they bought a, a, I call it a cottage on the lake, right? A little lake house. And family was important. And their family would come and visit here. So it's kind of like a bride. They, they got their grandkids and the children. Everyone would, would come together. It was really cool. And based on the current tax laws, the money coming out of the IRA, which was taxable, was offset by the interest on the mortgage of that. Follow me? So all Curtis had to do was then to also make sure that that money coming out of the IRA was always going to be secure based upon whatever the market, whatever the market did, and therefore taxable, uh, tax write-off pretty close to a zero, they benefited from that lake house and that family. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you there's so many different creative strategies that are there. Everyone's situation is different based upon what's important to you. Any more in the room? Anyone else in the room have a question they'd like to ask before we wrap up? One more online. So um, online. Nona has a couple uh, more opinions for you on investing. How do you feel about cryptocurrency? It's not that I feel good or bad, but I just want you to understand the, the difference. Cryptocurrency uh, is speculating. That's not investing. There, there's a difference. So I'm not saying invest or not invest. I just want you to understand that when you're investing in something like crypto, you're speculating that that investment will go up in value. There's nothing you can measure from a risk standpoint or what, what have you on that. So that's speculating, that's not investing. So if you came to us and said, hey, this is my risk tolerance. These are my goals for this money. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. It would not be prudent for us to say, hey, let's go put 25% in cryptocurrency. So if you choose to do it, just understand it's, just, it's speculating, which is different from investing. Wonderful. She would also like to know your um, knowledge or advice on investing in nationwide electric car stations and lithium. Okay. As a fiduciary, I, I can't give specific recommendations on that, but generally speaking, I would go back to that advisor alpha from, from Vanguard, and what you're looking for is how much risk do I need to take to earn a rate of return? This is what it means. If you have two portfolios and they're both earning the same rate of return, I want to know which one you want. They both earn the same rate of return. This one can lose this much. And this one can lose this much. Do you want this one or this one? You, you're right. You want the one that will lose less. Same rate of return, both portfolios, the one that earns less. So before we start talking and saying, should I invest in this, maybe over here, over here, let's look at it as a whole and say, hey, what's my risk tolerance? And I want to earn an appropriate return for that level of risk. When start to buy all these things and add it to our portfolio, now we're dealing with something called correlation and correlation or non-correlated assets. What happens many times you own multiple investments, but they all move at the same time. They all move in lockstep. All you've done is complicated your portfolio and increased costs. Does that make sense? And probably increase the risk. So in that, it's not that it's bad, it's understanding how do you build a portfolio to manage your risk tolerance and earn a re appropriate return for that. One that's predictable and stable in volatile times. Great question. 
I just want to thank you both. You are so super knowledgeable. Who learned something this morning? Who learned? Thank you. Anybody? Thank you. Yep. Applause. Does that mean we learned something? I just want a show of hands. Did who learned something? Yeah, wow, yeah, we did. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you. So thank you both again so much for giving up your valuable time to be here. And thank you for everyone for taking time out of your day to be here to learn something new. Um, we so much appreciate all of you and our education partners. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you all in December. So thank Thanks, you again. Brett. I think you're going to stay around for a few minutes Happy if anyone wants to, to talk one-on-one. -on -one.